This will be an interesting little uh, how-to for you guys. This is a Grandstream yeah, HT502. It used to be tied to a service provider, and I'm going to show you with a laptop, a DHCP and TFTP server, and a touchstone phone how you can unlock the device. So first off, we're going to start here. You're going to hold down this reset button until only the power light lights up, which we can do now. This takes a little bit of time, but that's how it goes. Talking about 10 to 20 seconds, I think. Once that is done, I'm going to move on to showing you how to create a XML config file and how to use the telephone to turn on uh, the web browser on the WAN port. So you're going to plug your computer into the WAN port. And of course, you're going to plug a phone into phone one. Okay. After having rebooted your device, you're going to need to open up like a notepad or something and find a place to save this file that you can find later. And you're going to create a file called CFG and then the MAC address of your ATA.xml. And you can see this one's mine right here. You need to put this in as shown. Essentially what this is doing is a little XML file that just blanks out the password section of the provisioning. It's going to convert the password to lowercase admin. Now once you've done that, get your hands on TFTPD64. Now you're going to want to run this software as administrator or else it won't save its settings and drive you insane. And you're going to configure it more or less as follows. First of all, you're going to go to global. You're going to turn off anything that's not the DHCP server and the TFTP server. From there, you select TFTPD. Browse the location of your file. I, cl I clicked on none for security. You can choose read only. It doesn't really matter. As for options, you can leave them alone except for this one. Bind TFTP to the Ethernet IP address you've chosen for your computer. After that, you can click OK, go into DHCP, and you're going to define the DHCP pool. In my case, I'm 192.168.69.8 with a pool size of 8. This computer's IP address is 192.168.69.1, so I've put in that as my default router, and then a usual netmask 255.255.255.0. Here's the important part. Additional option 66, 192. 168.69.1 is going to be my option 66. Option 66 is what grand streams use to define their TFTP server. So you're going to go down here. I like to select ping address before assignation. It doesn't really matter. Persistent leases is helpful if you need to reboot more than once. And then bind DHCP to this address. This is very important so that you do not accidentally end up like causing trouble on your main network or whatever. So make sure you bind that to the, the interface you've selected. Um, other than that, we're going to click OK. You can go to the DHCP server. I just reached down on the down low and rebooted the device. So you can see it come through. The logs here are going to show DHCP address stuff. And then eventually what you're going to see in a moment is you're going to see the unit ask for some files. This is the TFTP side. What you're looking for is it's going to request the CFG MAC address.xml file and you just want to make sure you can see that that file gets sent to the ATA. Once that file gets sent, the next thing you're going to do is you're going to pick up your telephone. So you're going to pick up the phone and you're going to dial three stars enter a menu option and then 12 when port web access disabled and then you're going to hit 9 when port web access enabled and what we've just done is turn on the web server on the wan port on this device 
The next thing you need to do is you need to reboot the device uh, for that to take. So while we reboot, um, you can watch the logs. You should just clear the log. You can watch it go grab its address and go through that whole rigmarole again. And you're going to go to a web browser and type in HTTP, not HTTPS, and the IP address of the device. And um, it will eventually just pop up with a login screen. But we can look at the DHCP server. You can see there that it has allocated at 1722, 1723, which is the time shown below, so you know it's current. And then you'll see it in the logs. It's just kind of a nice thing so you know where you stand in regards to the uh, process here. So it's going to grab the uh, config file again. And really, because the config file only contains the password, you're pretty much good to go. So you can see here now we have access to the web interface. And this is quite fantastic and easy. Um, the next thing I suggest you do is go through the settings and configure the device for your needs. Generally, you're going to want to turn off NAT router and set it to bridge mode. As well, you're going to want to give it an IP address <laughs> right here. Um, turn off LAN DHCP. So there, it's not a router, it's gonna be a bridge. You're gonna turn off DHCP and you're gonna give it an IP address that works inside your network. Because when we're done all of this, we're going to unplug it and plug it into the network using the LAN interface. And then you'll log into it again using the web interface, but on the LAN IP, and you can continue to configure as you need. Right now the unit's unlocked, I mean you're in, which is awesome. Other settings under advanced, I recommend what you do is you take these out and you maybe put like your default gateway, you know, of your network or whatever. The idea here is that Grantstream um, or your service provider may have a relationship with Grantstream. And the device may go to Grantstream's uh, servers, grab that config file similar to the one that I have generated, except it's going to contain the provisioning information for your service provider. That's the problem. It'll be one of two things. It's either going to just be like, basically just have this firmware server and config server path and like a password, and then you're gonna have to reboot again and and, and, and it's gonna actually go to your service provider to get the actual um, provisioning, or it's gonna just have the actual provisioning. Either way, the results, you're gonna get locked out again. These devices are a little bit older, and so generally they're up to date on their firmware. So I, I skip the firmware checks, of course, and I also, um, and there's another setting here. Automatic update, no. That's pretty much it. From there, you're good to go. You know, get the thing onto your network. Again, you know, remember the internal IP address you've chosen. And um, you can continue to configure the FXS ports. So the reason I went through this exercise is that these devices are available quite frequently. I've seen them at Value Village. I've seen them, you know, in garage sales, people have given these devices to me. And I've had a few people ask me like, hey, can you unlock this device because I want to use it with a different provider. So often uh, your device gets, you can purchase them from your, your provider more often than not. Um, and so the problem is, is if you buy the thing and then you switch companies, you're kind of out of luck. But this way, you actually have a useful device that you can either just resell or give to someone that can use it or use it for another provider or whatever. So that's pretty much it. Um, there are a lot of guides as to FXS port configuration that's sort of out of the scope of this. This is really just a guide on how to reset your ATA as a whole so that you can make it a useful device again. So yeah, I hope that was um, helpful. It's kind of a quick and dirty thing, but it does take a little bit of uh, knowledge.